tongue tied a bit here. Or repeat ourselves. Or repeat ourselves. I like how, uh, I know I said I wouldn't do it, but now I'm going to do it. I know, what's up with Tim? So I like, Jesus is telling us how to live, right? He's telling us how to live. And that life that we are to live is contrary to what the world lives. Wow. But it's supposed to do something to us. It's supposed to prepare us for something to come. So we're to change from what we were into a more Christ-like image for some reason. Joseph provides us the example of how to live out what Jesus is telling us to do. His very brothers, who he brings into the land, provides grain to, is going to take care of for the five more years of famine. He says, I was sent here just to take care of you, even though those are the people that threw him into a pit, sold him off to a caravan, enslaved him in Egypt, where God raised him to a position to serve as Pharaoh's chief executive. And then we have Paul's writing for today. Paul's going to tell us what all this is about. What all this is about. What it's going to go for if we live as Jesus is taught. I'm going to share now from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I know we've been in 15 now for three, three, at least three weeks. <laughs> and it's good stuff. So Paul's going to share. And I want to remind you, Paul's writing about problems that are occurring in a church. He doesn't waste time in his letters. He's not just warming them up and saying, you're doing a great job. Keep going. He's saying, I want to talk to you about your problems. And the biggest problem in Corinth was disunity. They were not united in theology, not united in their understanding of the gospel message that Paul had presented to them originally. So he's trying to provide correction from afar. And one of the things they didn't agree with or have a good understanding of was the resurrection. So let's hear what Paul writes. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but rather a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is, what is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so will also we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, the perishable inherit the imperishable. This is the word of God for the people of God. Okay. Thanks be to God. Friends, first I want to air a complaint. Can I do that? Can I air a complaint? Is that all right, Jay? You good with this one? All right. Zombies. That's right. That's right. What's the big deal with zombies? Somebody tell me. Tell me. Why are we so intrigued by zombies? Goodness. I turn on TV. Scary movies. They are scary. And they all, they all end with, what's the title? I know not to watch it because the title ends with, Of the Dead. All right? Day of the Dead. Dawn of the Dead. All the, I mean, they go on and on and on. I don't know why they've worn that out. 
There's far too many of them. And then they made it funny. They made zombies funny. Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, I mean, that was funny. Scary, but funny. That was a few years ago. But they got comic books. They got popular fiction. Everywhere you look, zombies. Zombies. I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time with it. So... I didn't know if you guys could come for me, so I had to look up some stuff. And some have argued that horror movies tap into some deep national or global fear and reinterpret it to fit the genre of the time. All right, let me explain. The monster movies of the 50s, all right, cool though they were, monster movies of the 50s, they were a response to nuclear threat, fears of science out of control. The robot movies of the 70s were a manifestation of the fears of people being replaced by automation. The apocalyptic movies of the last few decades reflect a fear of the devastations of war or the effects of global warming or pollution or who knows what. But it all leads to some terrible end. Movies that tap into our racial history and the fears of division within our society are also out there even today. But they also force us to look. They force us to look into our fear. No matter how silly they are, they force us to look into our fear. And, some, and our fear is that we are part of the problem. That we're not part of the solution like we thought we were. Kind of reminds me of that old comic strip, Pogo. Y'all remember Pogo? Am I the only one? Please, someone tell me. They, Penny, you're too young. All right, to remember it. Anybody remember Pogo? Pogo said, most famous line I think I remember from Pogo, maybe the only line. We've met the enemy and he is us. Our own worst enemy. But of course, you know I'm already upset today. What about zombies? I'm tired of these zombies. I have to think, if, if all these zombie movies are because I'm afraid of something that's going to happen and I, I've figured out my biggest fear is that I'm part of the problem, not part of the solution, why zombies? I can't watch zombie movies. They'll keep me up. They'll keep me up. I'll be walking the hallways with the shotgun. I'll do it. I'll do it too, but I hate the shotgun because, you know, that draws zombies. So I get the crossbow out. So now I'm walking down the hallway with the shotgun and the crossbow. You have to picture it in your mind, in my bathrobe. <laughs> what are these zombie movies revealing about our hidden fears? What are these, just these horror movies? Why are these horror movies, monster movies, whatever movies, apocalyptic, revealing about our fears? Some would argue that it's about AIDS or cancer or any number of medical threats that play upon, prey upon our minds and hearts these days. I mean, now when COVID came out, remember COVID come out, they, they thought that was going to cause the zombie apocalypse. All right, that or the injection, you know. I remember seeing those kind of memes out there in the press. Others would argue these type of movies uh, represents a soulless Leadership that seems to be marching all of us to an inevitable doom. But maybe I wonder, on the other hand, if it isn't a physical or political threat that really worries people, that people are really fearful of, that they seem to be more afraid because when they look at themselves through this movie, they figure out they're part of the problem, not part of the solution, maybe because it's not a physical or political threat at all, but a spiritual one. A spiritual one. And that'll scare us. That'll scare us. I wonder if we've neglected the Apostles' Creed so long that we've lost touch with the meaning of, I believe in the resurrection of the body. 
Well, maybe it's a stretch, but Paul had to contend with those who were scared of zombie in his day in this church in Corinth. Sort of. They didn't have the word zombies in Greek, so I don't know what they said, but they were, they were worried about it. Problem was that there were some who were repulsed by the concept of the resurrection of the body. And people would argue, who would want to reanimate dead flesh? Who'd want to re-inhabit this shell of what kind of, <laughs> you know, that we, we had to cast off on our death? That doesn't even include the problems of what kind of death they'd be coming back from. I mean, what if the body wasn't in shape as, as I am, you know, Adonis body? All right, but uh, <laughs> I got a snicker up from the Ed McMahon over here. And let alone if it was missing pieces, you know, people would say, yuck. So Paul, I just picture him deeply sighing and writing the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians to deal with this issue. What about the resurrection? What about this zombie thing you're talking about in this church? Well, I have to admit, as I read... Uh, Corinthians 15, where we started and such, at verse 35, Paul is admittedly wrestling with stuff that he really doesn't understand fully. And who could? All right, but he makes a number of different points in this argument. First of all, he argues that the resurrection is God's act. It's not a natural occurrence. This means that we can't simply look at our world the world that we're in, we can't look at our world and see what happens. We have to see with eyes of faith. But Paul mentions there are, however, God doesn't leave us without some hint of what he's talking about. All right? He makes our faith very tangible at times if we're willing to look. And so there are some symbols in this life that give us a clue about this resurrection thing. And so Paul uses the metaphor of a seed, right? You heard me talk about the seed. It's kind of odd how it's written out in our New Revised Standard. But if you look at it, he talks about a seed. He gives us some insight into what's going on in the resurrection. The seed is planted. It dies, okay? The seed is actually dies in the ground. And what grows out is something different. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, no, I'm not an agrarian type person. Uh, I'm so, I can't even get grass to grow. I'm so bad on my lawn, Mark. I'm so bad I've killed my neighbor's grass. So that's how bad I am. I'm always trying to water it and such to try to make it not look as bad as my yard. But I've never seen, whenever I cast out grass seed, seed growing. I see something, the grass seed's very small and dusty, you know, and I just throw it out there. I normally throw, the, you know, you buy the 50 pound bag. I do that in about a square as big as my pulpit to try to get something to grow. Can't figure out why it doesn't grow. But I notice when something does come up, it's a beautiful, soft, green little shoot, right? Have you noticed that? That's not what that seed looked like. I didn't plant something you know, fleshy and green and soft like carpet. It grew up different. That seed didn't wake up or reanimate. It was transformed in the process of creation. The body that came out was changed. What appears to me on the surface of the ground after I planted the seed in it is far different from that seed that died underground. In other words, what Paul is claiming here is that there is a new creation. A new creation. All right, he wrote about that in 2 Corinthians. We're going to get to that one too here in a few weeks. He, Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from the human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, in Christ, God has, is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Changed. Changed is what Paul's talking about. New creation. New creation. He's talking about living as a new creation. Which seems kind of odd, because he was just talking about resurrection, which seems to come from death. Now he's talking about living as a new creation. So this passage here in 15, this part 35 on through 52, is about the beginning of a transformation. The beginning of a transformation. So what we're doing is, we used to be a dead person. Christ, in Christ, we have received life. As we would said yes to his message of hope and love. Through his sacrifice on the cross, we have been made new. And now we're transforming. Even now we're transforming in preparation to be made new for eternity. And in fact, there are two statements in the Apostles' Creed that we could consider here. I really didn't think about reading the Apostles' Creed for our responsive reading, but you see how well I do with responsive readings. But in this, two statements, and really you're going to say, Tim, that's only one. No. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Okay? You see, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting two are two very different events. But they go hand in hand. They share the truth that they straddle that line between the world we know and the world that we're headed toward. They both speak to us of life that is bigger than death, or maybe better. Life for which death is but a moment, a pause before continuation. Um, but, but continuation, even continuation isn't quite right. Yes, life continues, but it's also about change, about transformation. And all this is happening. And it's hard for us to imagine because we're going to go through it, but we've not done it before. You go out and buy a new car, and you drove a car to the place where you're going to buy your new car, and you test drive that car, you've already driven a car before. Then I'm talking about something we've never experienced before. This is a transformation, though, that doesn't just occur at death. It doesn't just occur at death. I'm going to take you on a stretch here. This is a transformation that's at work in us from the moment that we accept the gift of life. Do you hear me, church? This is a transformation that is work in us now because we have accepted the gift of, of life, that gift that comes from the one who came, Jesus, that we might have life and have it abundantly. So not only do we have our worldly life, and we're walking around still with all that self. All right? I've mentioned before, when I accepted Jesus Christ, the next morning I get up, I look in the mirror, I looked exactly the same. Handsome as always. I looked exactly the same. But the pastor had said I've been changed. Well, I felt the change, but I looked exactly the same. But that change started working. And it needed work, else I would fall back into the ways I was before. I'd been justified and free to live life free. But I still had to eat. I still had to exercise. I still had to make money if I wanted to buy clothes and a car and that kind of stuff. And yet, not only did I have what even people who didn't believe in Christ had, they still, they have all that need, right? For shelter, for warmth, for security, for food. They have that. I also have God. And hope, love, peace. 
all of this more abundantly. We're living more abundantly. The seeds of that final transformation that we're talking about, final transformation into from this perishable, very frail body into the imperishable. All right? Those seeds of that final transformation are now at work in us, Paul's trying to say. From that moment that we claim salvation that Christ offers. So we claim the power of Christ's resurrection today. Today we claim it. Even while we wait for our resurrection, the transformation, my friends, is to be made more like Christ so that we can be in His presence. They won't, we won't look like this. So what Paul's asking us to do is show some glimpses of that life, that resurrected life now in our flesh. While we're still mortal, still subject to death, until our final transformation, show Christ, reflect that image of Christ as best we can. Be the new creation of God at work in us. That's what we're called to. And Paul describes that transformation in a very uh, interesting way. Verse 44 reads like this. Get this. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. And uh, so I was trying to figure that one out. One Bible commentator claimed that this is a very weak translation of Paul. All right, what Paul had said. And I have to, I have to tell you, forgive me, forgive me, Jay. Our Bibles were not written originally in American English. All right, the original Bible didn't have ain't in it. I've said ain't before when I'm reading it. Uh, but uh, it didn't have that kind of stuff. It was written in Greek. Our new ten, new, this letter was written in Greek originally. So, uh, or at least translated to Greek originally. The original one, the furthest one back they could find that they wrote our New Testament out of. So I don't think they did it right. And so there's a weakness that comes from this statement. Paul's trying to say that there is weakness that comes in the physical versus spiritual split that we often have to struggle with and comprehend when we're talking about this physical body, spiritual body stuff. Because we think, what does the spiritual body look like? Does it look like a ghost? Is it not a body so much as a spirit that people will be able to recognize as us? Because we don't know what it's going to be, right? Has anyone here ever? No. I know you haven't. You haven't been through the resurrection yet. So what if I translate that first sentence that I read, verse 44? What if I translate it and it read like this? What is sown embodies the soul. What is raised embodies the spirit. Now, we usually use soul and spirit interchangeably. But in the Greek, they're two very different words. In Greek, soul is uh, uh, suji, and spirit is pneuma. Now, soul translates to creatureliness. All right? Creatureliness. That's what it is. That's the best I could do it. See? And by that, it means that life force that makes us human, that makes us part of creation of earth and, and makes us mortal and spirit translates as the divine spark the divine spark the image of god in which we were created that true self of ours that god created the treasure that actually lives within this earthen vessel this fragile vessel that we're walking around in so we're going from creatureliness to being the spark, the divine spark. So something has to change along the way. That's that transformation. And we're living in that right now. Because we are in this life embodied soul subject to the needs of the flesh. We are fragile, earthly. We're focused on survival and self. And because of that, we are, can only ever be while in this vessel, a dim reflection of Christ. 
though he lives in us, because we're trying to overcome so much of ourselves. We're imperfect examples of a life of the Spirit. But don't be disheartened. Paul tells us one day we will be that divine spark, that true created self. Hmm. We'll be resurrected. We'll be embodied spirits, living not for ourselves, not subject to the needs of the flesh, but we will be able to mirror the God who gives us life now. Paul seeks to make the point that resurrection is real, not some ethereal, ghostly, undead, zombie-like kind of life. And as rich and as real and as wonderful as this life is, resurrection, my friends, is even more so. Even though words fail to grasp the realities beyond our experience here on earth, faith tells us that God has treasures in store for us. But the real joy is that we don't have to wait to start enjoying them. In our fleshly bodies, we can still overcome enough self to have hope, to have love, real love I'm talking about, to have compassion, to know God's comfort and peace. The world doesn't provide that. Only God. We have this gift now, and because of it, though we may think we are dying or already dead to life and living because of our self and our doubt, we don't let go of that life, that spark that is within us, that is the us to come. We have caught a glimpse of God. And my friends, that is enough to sustain us through this time of transformation until resurrection. Amen.